Okay, Karen, going back to you now with the introduction of Mahoud Damish. Okay, um, next up we have Mahoud, who will be discussing the dynamic switch between on and off responses in an olfactory. Um, sorry, just lost. Except the neurons. <clears throat> Thank you, Karen. <clears throat> Hi everyone, this is Mahmoud Demir. I'm a postdoc at Yale University. Today I'm going to talk about a novel phenomena we have discovered in Drosophila olfactory system. Olfactory receptor neurons in the Drosophila melanogaster can respond to odorants in two distinct ways. These are on responses and off responses. On responses are the responses that we see with many excited odorants. In this case, if you apply the odorant in a stepwise manner, where you would have a background odor, long background, uh, pulse and a short foreground pulse on top of that, the neuron will increase its activity when the odor, odor concentration increases at both the uh, onsets of background and foreground, as you see here as firing rate. And when the odor concentration decreases, the neuron activity will decrease. On the contrary, off responses are inhibitory responses. In this case, the A neuron will decrease its activity when pencil butyrate concentration increases. And when the concentration of pencil butyrate decreases, this neuron will increase its activity uh, as a post uh, inhibitory uh, rebound. In this particular case, if you notice, B neuron is just acting like an on neuron. Now I'm going to show you the new phenomenon I've discovered, which we call the inverted response. In this response, the A neuron will first increase its activity when the other concentration first increased. However, the subsequent increase of the other concentration will inhibit the activity of A neuron. Interestingly, when the other concentration is decreased, there will be a sharp high rebound in the neuron activity. So if this is not enough to show you that this is an unusual activity, let me summarize again. This neuron starts as an on neuron, then flips its polarity to off and starts to behave like an off neuron. And this phenomena is specific to the neuron. Only A neuron is doing this, but B neuron is just acting like an on neuron. Although this is a unique and novel uh, response type, on, and or, on or off responses are already shown in the field, including uh, mammal and the insect olfaction. However, these responses are either a circular function, including many neurons acting on each other, or the neuron is expressing multiple receptors. The inverting response, such as I showed you now, is also recently shown in light taste neurons. However, these neurons are also known to express multiple receptors anywhere between four to more than 10. Therefore, the phenomena I showed you now is unique in the sense that it is happening in a single neuron that expresses a single receptor and that is mediated by a single uh, molecule odorant. With the phenomena at hand, we ask the following, qu following questions. Does this phenomena depend on intensity of the odorant? We started with a low concentration of pantyl acetate, and at low concentration of pantyl acetate, the neuron is acting like an on neuron. It increases the activity whenever the odor concentration increases. Increasing the concentration a little bit more will invert the polarity of the neuron, as you see here with the rebound at the background of set, increasing further the intensity will flip the polarity totally, where the, at the foreground, the, there will be inhibition and the rebound will increase further. We did this experiment for many background doses. And as you see here, the neuron is on neuron below uh, a certain threshold of concentration. Above this concentration, the neuron is behaving like an inverted off neuron. Next, we asked it, when, when this inversion happens. In order to answer this question, we created a stimuli, which is set to a level which inverts the neuron, and it fluctuates at around that level. And then calculating, cross, calculating the cross correlation between the stimulus and the neuron, we were able to tell the polarity of the neuron. So when we calculate the cross correlation at earlier times, around six seconds, the neuron, the cross correlation extrema was positive, suggesting that and also showing that the, uh, uh, the response is on response. At later times, right before the odor is turned off, the extrema of the cross correlation is negative, 
telling us that the response is off. So the neurons switched the polarity in between these times. And where does this happen? Um, we can calculate the extrema between these two points. And when we do so, we see that the neuron starts as an on neuron and rapidly inverts to off neuron within one and two seconds. So this is an interesting phenomenon which happens dynamically and rapidly. And uh, next we asked if this of inversion phenomena is specific to pantylus state or if other others also could invert the neuron. Pantyl acetate is an acetate ester which has an uh, carbonyl group and five carbons are extending from single bond oxygen. We thought that maybe the odorants similar in structure to pantyl acetate could also invert. That's why we started by decreasing the carbon number of carbon atoms in the chain Removing one carbon still inverts the neuron. As you see, there is um, the inhibition and the rebound. Removing one more carbon makes the odorant uh, behaving, the neuron behaving to the odorant as on neuron. Doing this the other way, increasing the carbon of number of carbons up to 10, the odorants are still inverting and further increase doesn't invert the odor. So when, if you calculate the response of the odorant to the, uh, the response of the neuron to the odorant, odorant at the foreground and at the offset of foreground or background, with all these three metrics, the, neur the neuron inverse it is uh, polarity to the acetate esters with a carbon number between six and 10. Shorter chains and longer chains doesn't invert. This is an interesting finding. Um, you could ask if these odors are relevant to flies uh, ecology. They are. These acetate esters are a product of yeast fermentation, which uh, flies feed on, and this is re uh, directly re re relevant to their uh, life. More interestingly, this phenomena is also observed across species. Both Drosophila simulans and Erecta uh, have inverting AV2A neurons, suggesting altogether that this phenomena could be a general phenomena in Drosophila species. Next, we asked uh, if this phenomena, the inversion phenomena, could affect the uh, behavior of the flies. To answer this, we created a straight plume by releasing odorant in a laminar wind. And then we recorded the behavior of the animals in this arena, and then calculated how much they accumulate around the plume and the source, and used that as a measure of attraction. With this inverting uh, receptor deleted, flies were more attracted to the odorants compared to the wildlife flies with intact inverting neurons, suggesting uh, for, for all three inverting odors that we tested, suggesting that inversion could actually modulate behavior. Next, we asked what the mechanism of the inversion could be. I should say here that uh, this is still an ongoing research, but we were able to rule out four possible mechanisms. First, it is known that in the sensilla, where the inverting neuron resides, there are odorant binding proteins, and these proteins are thought to bind to the odorants and transport them to the dendrites. However, yet still we don't understand their full function. If these uh, uh, small molecules are responsible for the inversion, then perhaps deleting them could eliminate the inversion. However, it doesn't. When we do, when we did the experiment on a fly where three most abundant OVPs are deleted, the inversion was still intact. There is inhibition at the foreground and two high, very sharp rebound at the offsets. Next, we asked perhaps another small molecule in the sense in that, which is odorant degrading, degrading en enzymes could be responsible for the inversion. It was shown that esterase 6 specifically is uh, secreted in the sense in that, and it also acts on pentalacetate, which is the inverting odor. So that if we, if we remove this esterase, genetically, does it invert, uh, does it eliminate inversion? It doesn't. We still see the uh, inhibition and rebound in the order, suggesting that this particular ester is not, not the cause of inversion. And third, it is known that the neighboring neurons in the sensilla can talk to each other with an electrical coupling called effective coupling. So if you activate a neuron with its specific order, then later activate B neuron with its specific odorant, Activation of B, B neuron could inhibit the active activity of A neuron. Since our phenomena is also one neuron activating the neuron, one other activating the neuron, and the same other inhibiting the neuron, 
This could be mediated by affective coupling. However, expressing ORCO only in the inverting neuron by deriving uh, GAL, um, it's GAL4, which eliminates the activity of not only the neuron, but all the neurons in the fly doesn't eliminate inversion, suggesting that this phenomena is not mediated by affective coupling. And uh, the A neuron doesn't need B neuron to invert. And fourth, the inverting neuron, AB2A, expresses OR59B along with the obligate co-receptor ORCA. It was recently shown that there is another receptor that is also expressed in this uh, neuron, which is ir 25 If this phenomena is mediated by other binding to the OR59B and 25A, and these receptors are having one activation and inhibition properties, then maybe this is the cause. However, deleting genetically IR25A doesn't eliminate uh, the inversion, suggesting that the, the phenomena is directly mediated by OR59B uh, itself. It doesn't require another receptor. So all of these data suggested that this phenomena could be mediated by the receptor and the receptor could have multiple binding sites. One, one binding site could be activating the neuron. The other binding site could be inhibiting the neuron. We build a model in which the other first binds to the channel and then activates the neuron. And then only after this, other can bind a second time and then inhibit the neuron. When we simulated this model, this was able to recapitulate all the properties of inversion, inhibition during the foreground and rebounds at the offset of both. But, uh, foreground and uh, background. So this data and the model suggest that perhaps the inversion is happening at the receptor level with multiple binding sites. In summary, today I showed you uh, a novel phenomena where a single olfactory receptor neuron expressing a single olfactory receptor uh, neuron as a receptor is able to flip its polarity from on to off when a single uh, odorant is applied. This phenomena is dose dependent and it is a quick process. This is broadly observed across uh, ecologically relevant odorants and also it is conserved at least 10 million years. It can modulate behavior of the animals and it doesn't depend on the uh, uh, extra receptor in the neuron IR25A. It doesn't depend on most uh, three most abundant OBPs it doesn't depend on the uh, odor degrading enzyme S36, and it doesn't depend on effective coupling between neurons. And finally, um, a biophysical model with two binding sites is able to recapitulate the data. So, um, as a future directions, um, I would I would uh, study the mechanism more to figure out if the uh, if the, it is if this phenomenon is actually uh, mediated by uh, multiple receptor or multiple binding sites. Uh, our simulations and modeling uh, with these receptors indicates that there could there are multiple binding sites on the receptors. So using the genetic techniques, we can mut mutate the receptors and see if any of these mutations is eliminating um, or altering the inversion. Another possible mechanism could be the adaptation mechanisms because this neuron inverts only after the other is applied. Maybe it is mediated by adaptation mechanisms. So we could use, again, genetic techniques to alter uh, calcium signaling and phosphorylation, for example, and study if, this is, um, if these are involved in uh, inversion. And as a second uh, direction that we could go in with this project is, this uh, inversion is happening at the periphery, but we don't know what happens in the downstream um, compilation centers in the fly. For example, in the uh, antenna lobe, many local neurons and um, projective neurons come together. If there is another inverting neuron within these olfactory receptors, we don't know how computation, how, how they would interact and what kind of computation could take place. And also more interestingly, how does the inversion at the periphery affect the activity at the canyon cells and maybe lateral horn. And is there any effect? Is there any, does this inversion have a role in learning and memory association? And as a third, third direction, in a general direction, the phenomena of inversion is happening when there is a background uh, on the neuron. So this is actually indicating that having a background odor uh, where these flies live 
is could have dramatic effects on how the neurons are sensing odorants and how the odors are perceiving and uh, navigating these. There may there might be other inverting tolerance. Right now, we only have one, uh, which is AB2A. And also, this inversion phenomena can add another dimension to other coding. And also, um, perhaps it can help flies to navigate the prelims. And I actually have the perfect tool to uh, study this. Recently, I was able to, with my colleague in RAG, uh, develop a device where we can visualize the behavior and the stimulus together. So this is, um, I, I could go also study how this phenomenon is helping flies to navigate. With this, I would like to thank my group members, my PI Terry MNA, and my colleague Sirinivas who helped me um, analyze data and also build the model. I'd like to thank my collaborators in John Carson's lab, especially Gael and Henny, and um, Quarantine who helped in uh, doing the modeling of the um, receptor. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Oh, that was a really interesting talk um, to see that Thanks. kind of phenomena. So Monica Stengel has asked, is intracellular calcium concentration affecting the response? So I think this is getting towards the mechanism. Yes. Oh. Well, it could, it, it could possibly, yes. And that is one of the directions that we would like to follow up. Um, so this is happening. It is, this phenomenon is happening when there is an odor background and you have a, another odor which inverts the, uh, which causes a, a decrease in activity. So this suggests that actually the adaptation mechanisms such as calcium signal mechanisms could be involved. Yes. So that could be enough, that it could be involved. So, but you haven't tried experiments with FAPTA or anything? To no, not yet. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering, this is a question for myself, is there a relationship with the rate of desensitization? Like I noticed that some of the odors you put on as a tonic odor would kind of rapidly desensitize just in the background and other ones were desensitizing more slowly. And is there a relationship between how much they desensitize the receptor to their likelihood of inverting? There could be, yes, yes. So if you um, look at the different odors that invert, the rebound activity is different for, for different odorants. Um, so different odor could be, have different, I don't know, uh, the, the different inverting effect. Um, so yeah, I think short, short answer is that. Okay, and from an anonymous attendee, have you considered the loop topology of the ORs during the mutations? Okay, so if I understand the question correctly, if we can dilute the expression of the uh, receptor and then test. No, we haven't do that. Uh, okay, and it looks like uh, Zane has a question, one of our panelists. Hey there, great stuff. So, many Thank questions. You. so let, let me see. So was it specific? So I'll have this overlapping question so you can answer the way you like. So, uh, so was it Sensilla specific? If you were to do this in a trichoid Sensilla, would you still see some effects? And or if you were to record like a direct patch, because it's external recording here, then you say a loose patch is a lot of contribution from still the Sensilla unknown factor probably. If you were to do it by directly patching like some of the folks have done, would you still expect similar results? And finally, uh, along the same line, what I found out that if you add like a hydroxy group to a straight chain ester, that really changes the property of these AB2 neurons respond. Do you have some thoughts about it? Okay, uh, I didn't get the third question, but let me start with the first question. So uh, there is only one inverting neuron right now, which is the AB2A neuron. AB2B neuron doesn't invert. We tested AB1 uh, neurons, they don't invert. We tested AB3 neurons, they don't invert. Um, AT neurons, the tricot tri tri neurons, are not known to respond to odorants, so I don't think they will invert. Um, but if your question is to take this receptor and express in tricoid sensor, does it invert? Uh, we are running on, we are, we are working on that experiment. We don't know yet. Mm -hmm. um, and the second question was, 
If you do patch on the neuron, uh, do you get the same response? Yes, we would, because the firing activity is, wouldn't change um, depending on your method. The neuron will fire, I mean, the action potentials will be generated regardless of like where you measure it from. So yes, if you do the patch, it will, it will probably get, uh, give the same inversion uh, response. So just on that, so when you have this, um, uh, those response curves, it looks like it's very robust, what you have shown that yeah. it's independent of the, those, but the r mutant you use if you were to use different doses on that mutant, would still affect be the same? Yes. Or have you already done that? The dose dependence is true for all others. So for all the others that I tested and all, all the genotypes I tested, okay. the dose dependence is there. All in all cases, the neuron, uh, the inversion is dose dependent. Beautiful. Nice stuff, Manu. Well done. Thank you. Thanks. Two minutes. Um. There's another anonymous attendee question. Would you expect to see an inversion if you used as, as similar stimulation profile with optogenetics? Could the mechanism be like a depolarization block? <clears throat> a good question. Uh, no, um, we did electro uh, optogenetics on this particular inverting neuron. If you have a light stimulus on this neuron, it doesn't invert. So it has to come through the olfactory receptor and it has to come through the binding of the odorants. The light doesn't invert. And it looks like Robin Crew, um, no, that's an attendee. So I noticed that some attendees have their hands raised, but I don't think we would be able to hear you. Just to remind the attendees to please put your questions into the Q&A um, forum so we can address them. See if those get put in. Um, from Benjamin Sumner, how would you make a visualizable plume if you needed to exclude heat cues? Uh, I believe this is referring to my essay. Um, so the the plume that we used was simply a smoke and. Um, according to the, the test that we did the mutants, the heat generated with smoke is not actually affecting the olfactory behavior of the uh, animals. So we are not concerned about the heat. But how could you generate a stimulus without heat? Um, there are some uh, tra tracers that people use, which are not, um, which are a product of not combustion, but just a chemical reaction. So that could be one way to generate plumes, visualizable, but not um, having heat. I think we're just about out of time, um, but thank you for this insightful discussion. Next. Thank you very, thank you very much, Karen. Uh, I will go back to you very soon. Uh, right now, we are going to go all the way to uh, British Columbia in Canada. Erica Platner is going to be talking about the uh, mechanism of molecular recognition of odorant binding proteins. Erica, it's very good to have you here. Thank you very much. And I want to thank our organizers, Walter, Renan, and Coral, for the organization of this excellent meeting. So we have been interested in uh, the uh, olfaction in the gypsy moth, which is a very serious defoliator of forests and orchards in many parts of the world. And the female moths produce this chiral, epoxide uh, sex attractant pheromone known as plus disparator. And this uh, pheromone is of very high in antipurity. Uh, what interests us is the fact that the enantiomer or mirror image of this pheromone minus disparator is a behavioral antagonist. So even 5% of minus disparator admixed with the plus disparator significantly decreases trap catches of male moths. And uh, what is known is that these insects are able to detect by olfaction both of these enantiomers and clearly discriminate them. And this is very interesting to us. So we have been uh, focusing on the pheromone binding proteins, 
of this moth. It has two, PBP1 and PBP2. And some of the questions that interest us is the pheromone, of course, enters the sensillum through pores and then works its way through the sensillar lymph to the receptors about which we've already heard a lot today. Uh, but the question is, uh, what is the contribution of the pheromone binding protein to this transit process? Is it a transporter that facilitates the transfer of pheromone through the lymph? Or is it a scavenger that prevents the odorant receptors from being overstimulated? Or is it both? So we can study uh, pheromone binding protein and uh, ligand interactions by equilibrating them. And we can quantitate this with the dissociation uh, equilibrium constant, KD. And this was done a while ago. The two uh, protein uh, known PVPs from the gypsy moth differ in their enantioselectivity. So PVP1 prefers to bind a minus enantiomer, that's the behavioral antagonist, whereas PVP2 prefers to bind the plus enantiomer, that is the ferrule. Now, equilibrium assays are slow, so they can only tell us part of the story. What we really need to look at is the speed with which these uh, small molecules interact with the proteins. And here we can quantitate the uh, rate of association to get an on-rate constant, or the rate of dissociation to get an off-rate constant. And so here's an example of this. Uh, where we use a fluorescent uh, ligand to either associate or dissociate. And these two aspects, uh, quantifiable aspects of the molecular interaction are linked because equilibrium is reached when the on rate is equal to the off rate. And this is reflected in this ratio here, KD being equal to the off rate constant divided by the on rate constant. So uh, in recent times, we have studied at equilibrium by NMR, the binding of highly enantiopure deuterium labeled uh, dispardur enantiomers. And they were labeled at the sixth and fifth position. And uh, we placed them in the NMR tube with pheromone binding protein one and two, and looked at the effect that the binding had on the chemical shifts of the deuterium atoms. And we paired this with uh, in silico docking models where we docked into one internal site which dominates the binding and two external sites. And we use the interactions that we saw there to score uh, whether a particular deuteron at the sixth or fifth position would be either de-shielded relative to the reference in chloroform or shielded. And uh, long story short, we got uh, from our scoring the same patterns as we observed in our experiment. And so here's just one set of pictures that we got with the disparate enantiomers bound at the internal binding site of these pheromone binding proteins. Here are the focal deuteriums and here is the epoxide. And the take home message is that the enantiomer uh, the enantiomers of the pheromone are bound in different conformations, as we can see here and here. And they're also often uh, bind in the opposite uh, orientation. So for example, here is the long chain, here's the short branched one, here's the branch one, and here's the long one. So clearly uh, we can detect the enantio discrimination at equilibrium. We've done the opposite experiment where we focus on the protein. Uh, this was just done with PVP1, uh, the N15 labeled protein, and we titrated in the two enantiomers. And we found that some signals didn't move, others moved a little, others moderate, some strong. And more importantly, we found four enantiospecific uh, signals. And I should point out that we got the structure in this case of the so-called A form of the protein. This was obtained at low pH, and this form has the C terminus of the protein inserted in the internal binding site. 
So this form of the protein only has external binding sites. And so when we dock the ligand into the two external binding sites, here is site one and site two, we also determined that the ligand is bound enantioselectively. And we're going to come back to that when we talk about kinetics. But we're not the first ones to notice an external binding site on QPs. In 1994, Gehoudou photolabeled the Anteria polyphemus PVP, and she ended up photolabeling this loop here between helices alpha 2 and alpha 3 on the surface of the protein. And this is what we call a site 2. Uh, in our NMR studies, this region here was also the most dynamic. So what about the other form of the PVPs? This is known as the B form. And uh, we could not uh, measure that in our experiments. So we simulated it based on the first structure of a PVP published. We heard about from Bjorn Clardy this morning. Um, and so when we look at the the details of the dispar docking into the model, we see that the enantiomers are also bound in opposite directions. So plus dispar we have the branch chain towards us, whereas in minus dispar it is uh, away from us in roughly the same view. So there's also enantio discrimination, again, detected at the internal binding site. And I should point out that the B form also still has the two external binding sites. So PBPs have two forms, the A form, wherein the C terminus forms an extra seventh helix that occupies the internal binding site and the B form. Uh, and so the A form has only two binding sites on the surface and the B form has a third internal binding site. And how these equilibrate actually depends on the conditions. Usually the A form is more prevalent at low pH and at high pH, you often see both. And in the presence of ligand, you can stabilize the B form. So we saw that the ligand is bound deep within the protein in the B form. How does it get there? Well, we need to study that mechanism of ligand entry by kinetics. And the first set of studies we did some years ago was with tonsillated pheromone binding protein 2 whose fluorescence decreased as we titrated in a ligand. And so we were able to do kinetics. Um, we saw biphasic behavior, a very rapid phase we couldn't actually capture, and a slower phase that could give us an initial rate. But we could only do this with PVP2. PVP1 yeah. was too dynamic. So what we found was that the rate saturates with increasing ligand concentration. And this tells us that this is a two-step process where um, protein and ligand equilibrate give an intermediate, and this then slowly decays to a more stable form. And it is reasonable to assume that the more stable form is the internally bound ligand, whereas the intermediate is the external. So we were able to obtain various constants, and the important one is the on-rate constant which was enantioselective. So the preferred ligand for this protein bound faster than the less preferred one. The off-rate constants were the same. But we wanted to know about PDP1 and about that rapid phase. So we did experiments with uh, this ligand, NPN, whose fluorescence increases as it binds to the uh, pheromone protein. So one can titrate it in and get a nice isotherm, binding isotherm. And the kinetic experiments are done with stopped flow, where the protein is in one syringe, the ligand in the other, the syringes are depressed at the same time, go to a mixing chamber, and then a detection chamber. And so using this technique, we uh, noticed that there was a very rapid step that also saturated. So we had to add an additional step before the one we had already detected. So uh, from this study, what we concluded was that the protein and the ligand collide, forming an encounter complex. This decays a bit more slowly to an externally bound ligand complex, 
And then that decays very slowly to an internally bound form. And in the NPN experiments, we cannot distinguish between these two forms because the fluorescence of NPN doesn't change as the ligand moves from external to internal. And I should point out, me and Toronto more recently obtained very similar numbers for this very rapid step. And what she was trying to do is she was trying to do displacement experiments where she displaced with a non-labeled ligand the NPN from the PVP and measured the kinetics of that. And uh, we mutated our pheromone, but we are only going to uh, concentrate on the results with the pheromone in tumors themselves. So here we have the on rate and here we have off rate. Eight and minutes. this is for PVP1 and uh, minus this for lure uh, bound, that's the preferred ligand bound faster than plus this for It also came off faster. So overall, the preferred ligand was on and off faster than the less preferred one. And we see that when we look at the ratio here in this type of experiment, we're focusing on external binding. So um, the, the uh, um, enantial selectivity at the external site is really comes to the forefront. We then decided to do some studies with a fluorescently labeled pheromone. So here's the pheromone. We've added an oxygen and the linker and a fluorophore. And when this molecule is bound to the PVP, the fluorescence increases. And so we can do very nice titrations, get our binding isotherm, and determine that the ligand selectivity is the same as we knew before. So PBV1 prefers to bind minus and PBP2 prefers to bind plus this. And we verified by a displacement experiment with the corresponding enantiomer, non-labeled enantiomers, uh, monitoring the decrease in fluorescence uh, that, again, the, the fluorescent pheromones bind to the same sites as the non-fluorescent ones and we get the same in antiselectivity. So now we're ready to do kinetics. So here's the fluorophore by itself in the stop flow system, and here it is with the protein. And so by suitable correction, we can get a family of progress curves from which we can get initial rates uh, for PDP1 and for PDP2. And uh, analysis of this system, again, gives us a two-step binding model in this system, we could not detect the formation of the encounter complex. We could only detect the formation of externally bound uh, ligand and then the movement to internal binding. And um, importantly, both association steps are enantioselective. So in PVP1, for example, minus this parallel binds faster than plus, and PVP2 is opposite. And the same was true for the internalization step. And interestingly, the full dissociation step uh, did not differ between the two proteins. So both gypsy moth PVPs are able to discriminate between the enantiomers of disparlor, both um, as seen at equilibrium for stable binding, as well as from the point of view of association rates in the kinetics. And this happens at two uh, external sites or one internal site. And just a reminder, the external sites exist on both the A and the B forms of the protein, whereas the internal site only exists on the B form. And we've devised a kinetic model wherein the pheromone first collides with the protein randomly and forms an encounter complex. This then decays to an externally bound complex which then slowly decays to an internally bound complex. And uh, I think it is reasonable to propose that the rapid external binding could serve a ligand transport function, whereas the slow internal binding could serve a ligand scavenging function, preventing overstimulation of the cell. And with that, I thank all my coworkers, my collaborators, my funders, and you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much. Unfortunately, they didn't leave much time for questions. Are there any questions for anyone from the panel?
If not, I would ask the question, uh, how did you prepare the protein? And perhaps uh, you said that, but I missed that part in here. Prepare the protein. Yeah. We use a histidine tagged version and purify it uh, that way. But it's one of those that can be removed before yes. you do the assay? Yes. It is removed, yes. Okay, all right. All right, thank you very much, Erica. We move on now uh, to the next presentation by uh, Jeffrey Riffo. Uh, Jeffrey Riffo coming for us from the University of Washington. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Jeff for sharing the video that he, we presented here today uh, in the break. And now Jeff is going to be talking about the olfactory gating of visual preference to human skin and the colors in mosquitoes. Jeff is an endowed professor for excellence in biology, and you are going to see a justification for that during his presentation. He's with the Department of Biology of the University of Washington. He was previously a postdoctoral scholar at the University of Arizona in the laboratory of Dr. John Hildebrand. Jeff, thank you very much for your participation today. Great. Thanks, Walter. Um, and so I'm going to shift gears a little bit. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, vision and its role in olfactory navigation and target seeking, specifically with um, Mosquito Aedes aegypti. And um, for all of these mosquitoes, it, but first I want to, this is actually a very uh, collaborative project, and this was really driven by um, two graduate students slash postdocs in the lab. This is Claire Rush and Diego Alonso San Alberto. And it was a great collaboration with uh, Dr. Craig Montel and his postdoc, Yimpong Zan, and with Andrew Straw. And also I'll show some uh, work that two former postdocs, Clément Venuget and Floris Van Bruegel, who are now running their own labs, how they're, uh, some of the work they did on this project. Now, we're talking about odor tracking. And during flight, insects aren't navigating to the odor. They're actually navigating, the odors turning on their visual and mechanosensory systems to navigate to the wind and to their optic flow. And this is an important point because olfaction in and of itself is actually multimodal, okay? So, the, uh, so this, I, I think that olfaction is a fantastic opportunity for us to understand how these sensory systems are playing out uh, and how they modulate one another, they gate one another. This is especially true for uh, mosquitoes. As Dr. Leslie Vassal actually presented earlier, they are incredibly uh, sensitive to a variety of different cues. And oftentimes these cues can actually operate at different spatial scales. Uh, for instance, they can detect CO2, then they will use a suite of vision and skin odor to actually localize the source. And then they use heat to actually uh, initiate the bite, uh, biting and kind of landing response. So all of these cues are kind of acting in consort, but they also have a hierarchy. And we actually don't under, really understand very well the role of vision in mediating these host responses. Now, mosquitoes are a uh, vector of disease and they impact close to a billion people per year, but they are also very important in our ecological community. They perform, perform a kind of ecological community taxation, if you will, especially on these long -lived, lived animals in the environment, such as like an elk out here in Washington. Uh, they are pollinators, so they'll go to your plants and they'll pollinate them. Some excellent work by um, Dan Peach and Chloe Lahondaire have shown this uh, very nicely recently. Um, they're also an important food resource. And so they are kind of the chicken of the pond, if you will. So they're playing this really important role. And what I'd argue is that if we understand something about the natural behaviors and the sensory stimuli they are actually responding to, then we can really begin to understand how their brains are processing this information, how the behaviors actually respond using those naturalistic stimuli. Now, I'm, I'm concentrating on vision and olfaction, and this is very important for us as well. Uh, and also, uh, a variety of different other mammals. For instance, there's this great story about these analogy students at the University of Bordeaux who were given white wine with red food coloring. They knew what was going on. They knew something was funky about this wine that they're smelling and tasting. But what was interesting about it is that the, the scripters that they're using really altered when the white wine was red. And so what happens is that when the two sensory cues are coming into conflict, 
then for us, vision begins to over override any sort of olfactory input. Now, if the cues are congruent or together, they have meaning, have a single percept, then they can actually uh, facilitate one another. For instance, if you smell a rose, you can find a rose within a very dynamic visual scene. So it helps you. If you smell a pen, like this unfortunate small child, it will actually help that small child find the pen in its messy room. So when the two cues are congruent, have a single meaning, then for us, they can actually uh, kind of facilitate one another. Now we don't really understand what's going on for insects, but we know increasingly more how olfaction and vision are kind of modulating one another. And this was some fantastic work by John Kennedy, who first showed stripe fixation in mosquitoes, and he further showed kind of the strategies by which moths navigate to odors, is called odor conditioned anemotaxis. Uh, a variety of work since then has shown how these systems are coupled, both for behavior and neurophysiology. This is like beautiful work by Mark Fry and Michael Dickinson's lab. Uh, Rob Raguso at Cornell has shown that it impacts vision and olfaction, uh, nectar seeking in moths, and some great work by Sanjay Sane. Just This just uh, demonstrates kind of there's this growing literature on how odor modulates not only kind of wide field motion involving in optimotor responses, but also target seeking. Now, we know relatively little for biting insects, but what we do know is that it's very important. This is some beautiful work uh, done with uh, sitsi flies where the scent of a cattle will actually initiate an attraction to blue. And uh, this is with sitsi flies. They also like red and black. By contrast with mosquitoes, there's actually, the literature is kind of in conflict. Uh, some literature, uh, you, we always know that high contrast, like black objects are very attractive, but some other uh, studies that have looked at chromatic uh, kind of cues have actually shown a variety of different results. Some, some shown that like Aedes aegypti is very attracted to every tested hue. Some show that they're very specific in terms of like liking blue and red and some like violet versus uh, green and light yellow. So it's very unclear what's going on. All, there's this clear gap, however, in understanding how these different kind of visual stimuli, chromatic visual stimuli, control individual behavior of the mosquitoes. How do odors actually modulate that behavior? And then the other thing is that actually understanding what parts of the visual cue are they actually responding to? Are they responding to contrast, the reflectance, all of these things, and these studies haven't really been able to identify that. So we've been interested in kind of uh, closing these gaps. Now, this was work by Floris van Bruegel, a former postdoc in the lab. And what we were interested in is just looking at their behavior of the mosquitoes in a thin wind tunnel. And so there's a variety of different cameras. This is a multi-camera real-time tracking system. What Floris did is he put a visual object on the floor of the tunnel, and at a certain time point, he's gonna release CO2. And so when he releases CO2, all of a sudden, the mosquitoes become very attracted to the visual target. They're actually not attracted to it beforehand, but when the CO2 becomes uh, uh, available and they encounter it, then all of a sudden they become very attracted. And so CO2 appears to be gating their visual, visual uh, sensitization and visual attraction to these objects. So for the last several years, we've been very interested in this. Um, we want to really know is how do odors influence their color preferences or hue preferences in Aedes aegypti? Um, which spectral bands might be important for their attraction to hosts? And how are these uh, kind of cues represented in the, in the brain? How are they modulating one another? So do odors really modulate visual responses in the optic lobe? And conversely, do visual stimuli modulate odors? So to do this, we've actually been looking at a variety of different kind of uh, visual cues that mosquitoes might respond to. For instance, we look at nectar resources that they uh, like flowers uh, that are really abundant in the kind of green, green, blue, green band of the visual spectrum. We also look at uh, skin. And so our skin, no matter what the skin tone is, is really dominated by in the orange to, orange to red uh, part of the visual spectrum. Okay, that's relatively low in the green, around 20%, but as soon as it becomes orange, uh, it ramps up. And this, this doesn't really, this happens no matter what the skin tone is. And so we are very interested in understanding how does odor kind of modulate 
color spectral responses in the mosquito. So to do this, we again turn back to the wind tunnel. Um, this allows us to analyze the free flight responses of the mosquitoes, Aedes aegypti mosquitoes. We use this multi-camera system. And what we did is similar to what Florist did, is we put two visual cues in the upwind section of the wind tunnel. One is white and one is red, for instance. And then at a certain time point, we'll turn on CO2 and how it changes their behavior. We use a variety of different hues, white, red, black, uh, violet, green, or all these colors that appear to us, these uh, different spectral bands. And we tested the mosquito's response. Uh, what we found is that on the individual trajectory level is that mosquitoes really were investigated the visual objects, especially during CO2. So this is the top view um, shown here. This is the side view. And what we found is that they really, uh, really approached and investigated black objects. They also investigated red objects. For green objects, they were just, they investigated them, but they would go back and forth between the white. The white was always the control because they don't, are not really attracted to white objects. Now, we also looked at this through before applying CO2 and after CO2 and during CO2. What we found is that they only really investigated the visual objects during the presence of CO2. And so we applied a very small CO2 plume that they could experience, they'd come interact in and out with a plume. And once the CO2 was abundant, then they would actually begin to investigate and show a really strong preference for some of these visual uh, objects. What was interesting, so if you look at this, the individual trajectories, we can actually plot this in, in 2D space. Um, and this is an occupancy map. So if they go to a visual object or an area around the tunnel, uh, they would kind of cluster around it. And you can kind of see this as in clean air, they're going to the sides and the top of the tunnel. By contrast, when they're CO2, they go to the middle of the tunnel, they go odor tracking, and then they actually cluster around this red object, uh, downwind of the red object. By contrast, if we look at these occupancy maps for clean air or CO2, um, in, during clean air, they're not really that abundant within the tunnel. Within CO2, they're there and they're flying around, but they're just, they don't have a strong preference for the green object relative to the white. There's no preference at all. So we can actually create what's called a preference index, allowing us to compare between different visual stimuli. And this is just for each trajectory. I should say that we can quantify and characterize up to 5,000 trajectories in a given experiment. Uh, for each trajectory, we examined its preference or the time that it spent in, say, the test object or volume, say, the red object, versus the white object divided by the total time it spent investigating the object. So we have this for each trajectory. We did this for red. We did this for green. We did this for all of these different visual stimuli that we tested. What we found was very interesting, uh, that they really prefer these long wavelengths uh, objects, like in orange and red. Red was even more, sometimes more attractive than black. Um, but they're not limited in this attraction or this preference. They would also, they didn't prefer blue, like the sitsi fly, but they liked cyan. This is very interesting to us. <laughs> so I don't know what's going on there, but it's very interesting. Um, and so like they seem to prefer these uh, kind of long wave, wave, wavelength visual objects, but also some shorter or medium wavelength objects. I should say that we ran a bunch of controls where we did black on two sides, white on both sides, and we always swap out, swap and randomize the position of the cues. Um, so they really prefer have very strong uh, color preferences, but only during uh, carbon dioxide. I should say we did a lot of experiments looking at this and kind of controlling for contrast, but we were really interested in what's going on with these long wavelength colors or bands of the visual spectrum like orange and red. And we are really dominated in these uh, color spectrum from our skin. And so to get, get at this, we didn't want to test skin initially because <laughs> there's a lot of potential contaminants and things like heat and of uh, skin volatiles are probably even more important, and especially for biting and landing. And so what we did is we just took advantage of these uh, skin color cards, from Pantone skin color cards. They're artificial, but they actually mimic, uh, kind of match approximately the visual spectrum from, a, uh, from skin, for instance. So we use this one, say like R10, um, that kind of matches the spectra from some of these uh, uh, volunteers that we tested in the lab. We tested a variety of different skin tones. All of these are dominated in the orange and red. 
and they were all equally attractive. Okay, no matter what the skin tone is, it was always attractive because they're dominating the orange to red. We even tested a skin tone that people who use cheap uh, kind of tanning lotion, uh, and it's kind of this weird orange color, and we called it Bile 45, and even that was very attractive. And so we are very interested in then if you have these artificial skin colors, like what's going on, which parts of the visual spectrum from these color, uh, from these objects are actually mediating the attraction. What we did is we used these ultra thin filters, optical filters that we placed simply over the visual objects. When we did that, we could attenuate specific bands of the visual spectrum. Uh, for instance, around 450 nanometers. We could attenuate around 600 nanometers. And then we could attenuate in the red around 700 nanometers area of the visual spectrum. And then we looked at the response of the mosquitoes, their preference for the visual objects. What we found is that if you just have the skin hue, it's very attractive. But as soon as you uh, apply these uh, optical filters, especially the 450 and the, or rather the 600 nanometer and the 700 nanometer filter, all of a sudden uh, the behavior becomes really attenuated. By contrast, the 450 nanometer filter that would kind of block out the green didn't really impact the behavior that much. Um, but the 600 nanometer filter that blocked out the orange had a really strong effect. I should say that it's still not, it's, it's still not down to zero. You know, they're still going to it, they still see it, but it really attenuated relative to the skin hue alone, okay? And I should say that we did a lot of uh, controls where we applied like cover slips and IR filters, et cetera. They had no effect, none of the controls had any effect. So we were really interested in what is the role of olfaction and vision in mediating those responses? And so what we did is we took advantage of these mosquito lines that were generated in Leslie Bossall's lab with Connor McMiniman for the GR3 mutant, the ECFP. And what we did is we, that, that is very, uh, that transduces the presence of CO2. So we could actually use this line to look at the uh, effects of CO2. We also tested the heterozygote uh, as a control. And what we found is that for the GR3 mutant, their ability to detect the CO2 was eliminated and they actually no longer recruited to the visual stimuli. Now, we were also interested in testing these mutants that Yimpong Zahn actually generated in Craig Montel's lab. And Yimpong Zahn actually just published a paper in Current Biology last week on these mutants. He targeted the OP1, OPSIN1, and OPSIN2 genes. These are the really highly expressed in the 80s Egypt II. And OPSIN2 is very interesting because it's expressed in the R7 cell that might be involved in color vision. Uh, what, when we tested this, what we found is that both the OPSIN1 mutant and the OPSIN2 mutants uh, showed you know, complete behavioral preference for these skin tones. It didn't, the mutation of these single genes did not have any effect. When we crossed the two, so we had this double mutant, then all of a sudden uh, their, their visual preferences were eliminated. So what this means is that you can, if you knock out their odor, ability to encode the odor, transduce the odor, or their ability to uh, see some of these visual objects, the, especially the long, uh, long wavelength visual objects, then this eliminates their ability to see these skin hues. I should say that we then tested uh, the preference of these for real skin, and we found very similar effects. And so if you filter out kind of these long wavelengths from real skin, then it was uh, really eliminated the preference or the attractiveness of the visual object. So the question then becomes, how are these small objects processed? How are these colors processed in the mosquito's visual system? And so to do that, this was work by Clément Vinger and Floris van Bruegel when they are students or, wow, postdocs in the lab. Uh, and what we did is we took this mosquito line that was generated by Omar Akbari and it uh, uses a polyubiquitin promoter for GCAMP, so it's expressed everywhere. But it's actually very nice at this time, several years ago, there's great lines being produced now uh, from Lindy McBride and Leslie Bossall and Chris Potter, et cetera. But at that time, this line was great because it provided really robust calcium dynamics, uh, both within the olfactory system and in the visual system. And so what we did is what we could do is we stuck these mosquitoes, we uh, glued their heads to this uh, kind of uh, microscope uh, flight stage. We could do use pho two-photon imaging to image the calcium dynamics within these different brain loci. 
And we could also quantify their behavior at the same time while we're presenting different visual or olfactory stimuli. And so we could, what we did is we targeted the lobula. This lobula is actually this region within the um, optic lobe that's really uh, targeted for kind of small object detection. And we could image the calcium dynamics within the lobula very readily. What we found was really cool is that if you present the mosquito any of these small targets or, or like a stripe or a square or a small blob, uh, you get really robust responses in the lobular neuropil. By contrast, if you give the, uh, present the mosquito some wide field visual motion like optic flow or star field, then the lobular responses were actually suppressed. And so we didn't get any sort of responses. So the lobular neurons are actually very responsive to small field uh, targets like those that we presented within the wind tunnel. So how does odor modulate responses? If we provi provide or present like a square or a blob, you get, can get a response a little bit in some of these uh, lobular neuropil. But if you provide it with CO2, then all of a sudden you get these really, the response is amplified. And so you get a much stronger response that's really uh, amplified and increased in gain. So the odor is increasing the gain of the system. And you can get also some differential responses. For instance, a uh, blob will actually cause an increase or excitation in the lobular neuron. By contrast, if you present it with CO2, then you can get some suppression. So the neural ensemble within the, uh, within the lobula has kind of uh, nonlinear dynamics when presented with these multimodal stimuli. So it's pretty interesting. So the question is, how is this occurring? Well, similar to Drosophila and a lot of other insects, um, octopaminergic neurons really readily innervate the optic lobe, including the lobula. And these octopaminergic neurons also innervate the olfactory system or the primary olfactory system or the antennal lobe. And you can actually see these neurons between the two. And so what we think is going on is that these neuroamines or octopamine provides a mechanism for this modulation and linking between the two sensory systems. And so when we actually uh, present, say, this lobular neuron with odor, you get a really robust response. If you present it with, if you micro-inject octopamine into that region, what you find is that octopamine can actually recapitulate those odor-evoked responses in the visual system. And so we think this is what's going on in terms of this modulation or odor evoked modulation of the visual system. I should say that we did the same experiments, but on the antenna lobe. And what we found is that the antenna lobe does not, is not modulated by visual responses, okay? So the odor is modulated in the visual system, but what we found in the antenna lobe that any sort of visual input doesn't really change their encoding of odor information, okay? So this was, that was kind of interesting. So just to summarize some of what we found is that odor really sensitizes these very specific chromatic channels. And so as soon as they smell something, they will actually go to the visual object, and, but it's very specific, cyan, red, orange, black. Um, what was interesting though is that mosquitoes really prefer some of these long wavelengths. And these long wavelengths are associated with those that dominate or are reflected from our human skin. And that odor and vision is critical for mediating this attraction. And then finally, what we found is that odors really modulate the optic lobe responses. And we think this is through octopaminergic neurons. We're continuing some of this work. And what's interesting is that um, this makes sense in terms of the actual history and the kind of behavioral strategy of the mosquito. The mosquito is actually using odor to navigate and detect the host. It's then using its vision and other sensory cues to actually locate the source of the odor. So in this case, the odor should sensitize and modulate these other sensory systems in order for that location, for the animal to locate that, the position of the animal. So with that, uh, I should say all of this work is either presented online, posted online, or uh, published. We just uh, posted the uh, chromatic preferences uh, on bioarchive last week, I think. I have no idea. I think it was last week. Time flies. Um, so I'll take any questions. I should say that I have five open postdoc positions. So if you know of any graduating graduate students or anyone that's looking for a postdoc, especially those that are um, interested in kind of quantitative behavior in neuroscience, 
uh, please send them my way. My email is up here. And so I'll take any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, so let's move on to the questions. We have quite a few questions here from, uh, from the chat and the, uh, also from the panel. Let me start with this one from Ines Ribeiro. Uh, really interesting talk. How many photoreceptors does the mosquito retina have? And does that match the color preference you observe? Yeah, that's a great question. And so Sharon Rose Hill, who I think is presenting later, uh, one of her students did some fantastic transcriptomics showing that there's all of these uh, a suite of kind of uh, long wavelength photoreceptors in the AD's eye. And there's actually five functional uh, opsins. And we actually don't know anything about uh, their kind of tuning or expression patterns, although uh, Joe Otusa has actually done some very nice work, but it seems like at least for their color preferences and the expression of these opsins, it may be very different from uh, what's observed in Drosophila in the pale and yellow uh, uh, cells. So anyways, it's, it's very interesting. And there are also a question from Ben Summer. Uh, does the mosquito land on the dots? Oh yeah. And so <laughs> we think they do. Our angle of our cameras are not that uh, acute enough to actually see the landing. And so um, I was trying to convince uh, Flores, hope maybe Flores is here, uh, to actually, he has a HDR camera. So he was getting, trying to couple the behavior of these mosquitoes and their landing and kind of uh, crawling behavior, walking behavior. But uh, we haven't been able to, this large kind of 16 camera system wasn't enabled us to really determine their landing and fine scale uh, behaviors. We have another, we need another camera system for that. Uh, there is a question from the panel, T Teru. Uh, can you open the microphone and ask your question directly? Hi, Jeff, uh, great talk. I'm really impressed. So first of all, the, I'm interested in the red color detection in a mosquito. Is that only able maybe in a specialist of the human? Uh, because the generalist mosquito, they don't probably have to necessarily find the reddish skin. Yeah, you know, the, uh, the most I can say is that there's some beautiful work uh, done by Adam Blake, who is a, um, he was a graduate student in Gerhard Ries' lab, um, and he worked with Dan Peach on kind of olfactory gating of uh, visual response to fluorophies. And he's done some very nice work on ERGs across these different species, and they're very subtle differences. And so whether that might reflect in kind of the photoreceptor tunings and uh, numbers, I, I'm not sure, but it's something that would be very interesting to look at. Mm, yeah, thank you so much. And also the octobamine receptor, is that expressed in a lobula already known? Yeah, we're looking at that now. And so it'd be very interesting because uh, it seems like there's very different kind of uh, microcircuit modulation going on both in Drosophila and perhaps in the mosquito as well. So it, it's fascinating. We're looking at kind of color opponency in the photoreceptors and also seeing where these octopomy might be modulating in the optic load. Uh, Louis uh, asks, uh, this is, uh, the species may have a big uh, variation to respond to different colors. What kind of color are good to attract Anopheles mosquitoes, nighttime activity? <laughs> <laughs> we use UV light or, or, uh, or light trap to capture them, but do you have any comments on that? Yeah, we tested, um, we tested Anopheles uh, Stevens eye, and we tested, but not Calusia, you know, and also uh, Culix, Quinky fasciatus. And what we found is that their attraction to visual objects also occurred during CO2, but you really had to limit the light levels um, for them to actually go to the visual objects. But there's some very interesting color differences like Quinky Fasciatus, light blue um, and red. By, con by contrast, uh, Anopheles Stevens eye liked red and black, but not blue. And so there's some very interesting species uh, level differences going on there. Um, but odors appear to be modulating their visual responses in all, of, all three species. Uh, Monica Stengo is asking, uh, do others directly stimulate octopaminergic uh, neurons? In Manduka, in Manduka they uh, project into the antenna, appears uh, the project, uh, the project in the antenna appears to be rather an output to the sensory neurons. Uh, 
Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, it, it would be uh, wonderful to look at this. We're not doing that with right now or anything, but we're, we're also looking at dopamine for learning. And so we're very interested in seeing how other stimuli can actually activate some of these uh, dopaminergic neurons. It'd be fun. Uh, Les Boschow in the panel has a question. Yeah, super, yeah, super interesting. Um, the whole question of human skin tone is a very fraught topic, just given the geographic distribution of mosquitoes and disease. And so were you implying that people with darker skin tone are less or more attractive to mosquitoes? Uh, they were, they were equal, uh, you know, based on the color card, card responses, um, it looks like they are equally attractive. You know, I mean, I the, guess like the, the, the Pantone cards look like they, they didn't trend very much toward, toward actual sub-Saharan pigmentation. Uh, they did, you know, but there's, there's darker cards. The key thing there is that if you look at, there's all these cosmetic, old, older cosmetic uh, studies that are interesting. Um, but if you look at the reflectance of any individual, um, they are your skin is really dominated in the, in the orange to red, even no matter what your pigmentation. And so I think that's what's going on for the attraction of at least for Aedes aegypti. Thank you. Yeah. I think in the same line, there's a question here from an anonymous attendee. Uh, what do you think about mosquito land in dark colors? Oh yeah. And so, um, you know, it's interesting. If you take a super dark green, um, it's still not as attractive as a lighter red. And so they do like darker, they will go to darker colors, or, um, but the chromatic information is still really modifying and changing their responses. And so you can have something for Aedes aegypti, you can have something that's very, very dark blue or, or green that to our eyes look almost black. Uh, but mosquitoes, Aedes aegypti could actually tell that very readily would go to the red. You know, so the contrast, we did all these uh, experiments for controlling the contrast, the darkness of the object, and that's not really modifying the responses. It's really the, we think it's a, it's um, a color, true color uh, preferences. Uh, good thing that you cited the paper of 1938 from John Kennedy. Uh, not so many people know that this it, whole study on uh, uh, wind tunnel Start with uh, Aedes aegypti work from John Cannon, right? Yeah, it's great work. Uh, Eduardo uh, is asking, beyond our visual spectrum, can Aedes mosquito or other species detect infrared or ultraviolet? Would it be possible to test this in your behavioral assay? Yeah, you know, so uh, they can see, you know, so uh, Adam Blake and Dan Peach have done some really nice work on UV sensitivity. Um, I can't remember, uh, I think yeah, in, sure. in 80s or maybe it was Culex, but um, I, they were sensitive to uh, UV. In terms of IR, I, I, uh, we didn't actually see any responses. We don't think, they, they are very sensitive to radiant heat. Uh, and so, but they have uh, thermal receptors on their um, antennae for that. And that's more of a closer range cue. Uh, Julia asked a question, part of it you already answered, so I'm going to get with the last, last part of the question. Uh, can this approach be applied in light, light traps for surveillance? Yeah, I think so. What's really interesting is that all of these traps tend to use like green or, or white. And that's really a poor decision. <laughs> uh, by contrast, if I think if you use like orange, red, um, maybe cyan, I don't know. Uh, I think that would actually increase the, the, uh, the trap, trap catch uh, pretty dramatically. That's one, but like they don't, they don't really like white. So why are we using that to increase the contrast of the traps? But you could increase the contrast of the traps by just changing the color. So that's, yeah. that's the way I would go. Yeah, I was asking, when do you do the visual preference as say in the presence of CO2? Do you provide CO2 plume throughout the entire assay? or do you just provide a pulse of CO2 for a given time? Yeah, that's a great question. And so what we do is we uh, run the experiment for three hours and then we, the middle hour we give the CO2 and the CO2 is in this uh, thin plume, it's the size of your thumb. And it's almost like a sausage moving through the tunnel. And so the, uh, but we're interested and we did these experiments where we are pulsing the plume because we are worried about adaptation and changing. 
the behavior. And the mosquitoes were encountering the plume. They're moving so fast. They're freely flying. They encountered the plume so infrequently that you actually didn't need to pulse the plume itself. And so they, when we sh examined their behavior over time, we didn't see any like great change, at least in these uh, time durations. Lorenzo asks, uh, have you looked at the mushroom bodies or central complex uh, to check whether there is a qualitative change there? Uh, that would be interesting. Uh, it's very beautiful <laughs> by looking at the immunohistochemistry, uh, but we have not gone there. You know, there's still so much to be done in, you know, the peripheral neurons or the second synaptic level. So many open uh, questions. There's an anonymous attendee asking, could you, uh, could one use white or green blankets? I assume that's for protection against mosquito bite. Yeah. I think so, at least for Egypti and perhaps for, um, for Anopheles, yeah. All right, so it seems that uh, we have addressed most of the questions. Thank you so very much, Jeff, for your participation here. Time for us uh, to move on. And now I'm going to turn it over again uh, to Karen Menuzzi. Karen. Thank you. So next up, we have a keynote lecture from Anupama Dahanakar from the University of California at Riverside. Uh, she was formerly a postdoc with John Carlson's lab at Yale. Thank you, Karen. And thanks to Walter and Wynnum and Coral for organizing this wonderful meeting. Uh, I'm very happy to be um, part of it. And so I'm gonna be talking about uh, taste variation in the context of host adaptation. And chemosensory behavior has uh, long been explored um, as a mechanism that underlies um, host adaptation. And in particular, host specialists are a really good model to understand evolution of uh, chemosensory behaviors. And so there are numerous examples of uh, host specialists in insects, and some even in the Drosophila melanogaster subgroup to which these two species belong. So one generalist here, Drosophila melanogaster, and a specialist, Drosophila seychellia. And so Drosophila melanogaster here, is a generalist that can take advantage of a wide variety of plant resources, um, plant hosts. And Drosophila seychellia, on the other hand, diverged from Melanogaster about 3 million years ago and is a specialist on a single host plant. Uh, not diverged um, or diverged only recently from seychellia is another generalist species, Drosophila simulans. And so together, this group really offers a very nice system to understand variation in chemosensory function and behavior and to identify the genetic changes that accompany this variation. And so a little bit more about Drosophila seychellia. So this is a specialist, it's endemic to the Seychelles Island. And, and um, in fact, it was discovered many, many years after the generalist species because it was never caught in the banana traps. Its host plant is Morinda citrifolia or noni, and it uses the noni fruit as a substrate for feeding and oviposition. No other Drosophila uses the noni as a host plant, um, which in fact um, makes uh, so many um, stinky volatiles that it's also called the vomit fruit. And these um, components are um, fatty acids. And so this is just a very brief summary of components of noni pulp or noni juice. And you can see here the fatty acids, um, primarily octanoic acid, as well as hexanoic and decanoic acids are present um, to almost the same extent as sugars. And so um, many labs over many years have been looking at how Drosophila seychellia has adapted to noni and in particular to these particular components. In the next couple of slides, I'm just going to summarize what we know about um, sort of uh, the adaptation in Drosophila seychellia to these um, noni acids. Um, so first, um, Drosophila seychellia shows quite a bit more attraction to noni volatiles here compared to the generalist Drosophila melanogaster here. 
It's also able to feed and survive on these noni acids for much longer at concentrations that would kill the generalist Drosophila melanogaster in just a day or two. And it also chooses to oviposit, to lay eggs on substrates that contain noni acids, hexanoic acid and octanoic acid over here, which the generalist sister species, Drosophila simulans, avoids laying eggs on. And so in recent years, there have been some really elegant studies um, that have sort of linked very specific genetic differences um, in chemosensory um, genes and olfactory receptors um, that are important for these differences in olfactory behavior. But we know very little about taste um, in spite of the fact that taste is certainly involved in feeding and OV position. And so we decided to address this question by looking um, at feeding and characterizing behavioral differences between the generalist and the specialist species. And so most of the behavior data I'm going to show you today um, is um, derived from these binary choice assays, uh, where essentially flies are given a choice between two tastants um, with two different dyes. They're allowed to feed in the dark for a couple of hours, at the end of which um, each individual fly is scored. Uh, based on the color of the abdomen and a preference index is calculated um, for the plate. And so one of the first experiments that Manali Day, a student um, who in the lab who's led this project did, was to test um, sort of behavioral response feeding preference um, to a mixture of these three noni acids um, at approximately the ratio that's found in the noni juice. Um, mixed with sucrose. And she tested three different species, two generalists, Melanogaster and Simulans, as well as the specialist Seychellia. Each of the three species are able to choose sucrose um, when it doesn't have any acid, when the alternative is water. So this is the palatable um, uh, tastant. And when the acid mixture, three acid mixture is included with the sucrose, it remains palatable to Seychellia, but now the generalist species are indifferent to it. And this difference between the specialist and the generalist is pronounced when the alternative is a palatable one millimolar sucrose, right? And so what this result suggests is that when the three acids are present in this mixture, they render this five millimolar higher concentration of sucrose less palatable to the generalist melanogaster and simulants um, but to a much lesser extent to Drosophila seychellia. We also noticed that the amount of dye in the abdomen of the generalist species was less. And so we dissected the flies that participated in these binary choice assays and quantified food intake. And what you'll see over here is when the acids, noni acids were included, they actually suppressed intake in melanogaster and in simulans but increased or stimulated food intake, although to a small extent in Drosophila seychellia. We then wanted to look at the behavioral feeding behavioral responses to individual components, to so the three acids individually to see how they contribute to these behavioral differences. And for this set of experiments, we essentially added increasing concentrations of one of the acids to five millimolar sucrose and or offered that as an alternative to one millimolar sucrose. And again, the three species are very easily able to choose the higher concentration of sucrose over the lower concentration of sucrose when no acid is present. But when octanoic acid is added in with the higher concentration of sucrose, the generalist species begin to avoid it, right? Choosing the lower concentration of sucrose instead, whereas um, it still remains palatable to Drosophila seychellia. Similar results were found with decanoic acid. So again, comparing the behavioral response of the specialist to the generalist, as well as with hexanoic acid. Right? Although the behavioral threshold concentrations for rejection are different for the different components. And so based on these results, we hypothesized that maybe there is going to be a difference in bitter taste between the three species. And so what we're looking at over here is a um, phylogenetic tree of the gustatory receptors in Drosophila and the receptors that are present in melanogaster in blue, and simulans in orange, and um, Seychellia in green. 
And many of these in Seychellia are actually pseudogenized as indicated by these um, red slashes over here. And so it's reasonable to expect then that maybe these noni acids activate the bitter taste neurons and that um, the response may be weaker in Seychellia and therefore um, it avoids the noni acids to a lesser extent than the generalists do. And so we can test this by performing extracellular tip recordings from taste hairs. And this is the lobellum of the fly. And these are the taste hairs over here. And indeed, we did find, uh, we did observe spikes as shown here when we tested uh, octanoic acid, right? Similar to when we uh, get spikes with sucrose. So the amplitude difference um, in the spike between octanoic acid and sucrose indicates or suggests that um, the spike is originating from a different neuron. So let me um, explain that in a little more detail um, what I mean. So here's the neuronal organization in the labellum. And so there are three types of labellar scintilla, the long scintilla, the short scintilla, and the intermediate scintilla that are present in a stereotypical pattern in the labellum. We focused um, for this initial analysis on the L-type and the S-type scintilla, both of which are innervated by four taste neurons indicated in these colors over here. The difference between these two types of scintilla is that the L-type scintilla have no bitter sensing taste neuron in them, whereas the S-type scintilla have one bitter sensing neuron in them. Okay. And so when we recorded with um, hexanoic acid um, from L and S-type scintilla um, uh, over a concentration range, what Monali found was that uh, there's a dose-dependent response to hexanoic acid, right, that we can observe in S-type pairs, but not in the L-type pairs. And so that's consistent with the expectation of a response from the bitter neuron. But we confirmed that this response was from the bitter neuron by using gen genetic silencing uh, methods to silence either GR32A 30 bitter sensing neurons or GR64F sugar sensing neurons and then recording with hexanoic acid. So, so shown in these sample traces over here, uh, when the GR32A bitter sensing neurons are silenced, we also lose the response to hexanoic acid, but this response is maintained even when the GR64F sugar sensing neurons are silenced. And so the data are quantified in this graph over here. So again, showing you that GR64F sugar silence flies um, have no response to sucrose, but they retain the response to two different bitter tastings as well as hexanoic acid. Whereas when we silence the GR32A bitter neurons, then um, the response to two different bitter tastings is um, lost along with the response to hexanoic acid, but the response to sucrose is maintained. So together these sort of, um, uh, um, demonstrate that the spikes that we're observing in the S scintilla are originating in bitter neurons. And so then Manali went ahead and surveyed the S type scintilla in the three species with the three noni acids uh, across a range of concentrations. And the results are shown here. What I want to point out is the response in Seychellia to decanoic acid right, is significantly lower than the general list, um, melanogaster and simulans. The response to oxtanoic acid in Seychelles is also significantly lower than one of the two sister species, um, generalists, but not both. And there's not much difference in the response to hexanoic acid. And so this was a little bit surprising, and it's summarized over here. The significant differences are marked by these um, um, brackets over here. And uh, you can appreciate that although the response in Seychellia may be weaker, that this pattern doesn't really correlate with the behavioral differences that we observe between the three species. And so um, while it's possible that um, since the that we haven't surveyed yet or taste organs that we haven't surveyed yet have differences in bitter taste of these noni acids, um, we also wanted to set up the stage to explore other parameters of bitter neuron function. And particularly recently, um, there have been reports that certain acids also elicit offset responses in taste neurons. 
And so we only have data for Drosophila melanogaster so far, uh, but it sort of sets up the stage to begin to compare um, these um, offset response dynamics between the three species as well. And so this is the work of Liz Brown and Alex Keen's lab, who's been collaborating with us on this project. And I just want to point out that these are the results of her calcium imaging experiments uh, where she's expressing DCAM6 in the bitter taste neurons and looking at responses to the three known yeses as well as a bitter taste in, as for control. And you'll see here that for each of them, there's a, a peak response, a peak change in fluorescence once when the stimulus is applied, but there's also a second peak in each of these cases when the stimulus is removed, um, indicating that like some of these other acids that have been described in the literature now, that these noni acids also elicit an offset response. And perhaps the variation in GR between the different species contribute to changes uh, to differences in offset responses. And so we're now building the tools to be able to examine these responses with calcium imaging in a Drosophila seychellia. In the meantime, however, we began to explore the variation, potential variation in another taste pathway. So a few years ago, we and other labs um, found that aversive tastins also act on appetitive taste neurons by inhibiting sugar response of this, um, this sugar sensing neurons. And so we asked whether noni acids are capable of inhibiting um, sugar response. And if so, whether there's a difference between the different species in terms of the inhibition. And so what I'm showing you over here are the results of paired recordings from Sensella, right, with sucrose alone, right, where it says zero, and followed by a recording of, uh, with a mixture of sucrose and um, noni acid and at two different concentrations over here. And we tested all three species. And what I think you can appreciate is that the presence of octanoic acid uh, in impairs or inhibits the sucrose response in melanogaster and simulans, but only weakly, if at all, in Drosophila seychellia. And this is for octanoic acid. I don't have the time to show you the data for all the three species separately, but um, I just thought I would summarize it over here. And if we compare the two species, Drosophila simulans and Drosophila seychellia, that diverged more recently, we find a very big difference in the extent to which the sugar sensing taste neuron is inhibited by um, each of the noni acids, right? And so this difference uh, essentially correlates with the behavioral differences that we have observed between the two species. So supporting the idea that this difference in, very, in sweet neuron inhibition is an important factor in uh, the behavioral difference. And so that's something we're following up in terms of looking at candidate genes. However, when we compare with Drosophila melanogaster as well, then potentially we have to look at other mechanisms that may be involved, um, particularly for hexanoic acid. And we don't yet have a very good explanation for this. And so in the last few minutes, uh, what I wanna show you is that we think a third, another taste pathway is uh, affected as well. And so these, um, uh, this was actually uncovered through binary choice experiments where we used the same concentration of sucrose. So this is two millimolar and a both stimuli. Uh, and uh, with, a, with a noni acid added to one of them. And so here without any acid, essentially the mean preference index is not significantly different from zero, indicating that both, uh, both sides or both choices are equally palatable as expected to each of the three species. But when we add octanoic acid in with one of those alternatives, we can see that that increases the preference for the mixture or there's increased preference for the mix mixture in Drosophila seychellia, but not in the generalist species. And certainly as the concentration increases, as I showed you earlier, that the generalist species avoid the mixture, right? Whereas the specialist um, of 
it reduces palatability for the specialists as well, but to a much lesser extent. And so here we're looking then at results only for Drosophila sexualia, uh, tested with each of the three known acids in this um, assay of two millimolar sucrose versus two millimolar sucrose. And for each of them, there are at least a couple of concentrations, right? So some part of this concentration range where the presence of the acid significantly increases um, feeding preference in Drosophila sexualia. And so one, um, one thing is that we haven't been able to, uh, to observe uh, sort of consistent or robust responses in electrophysiology from the sugar sensing um, taste neurons with noni acids alone. And so what we decided to do instead then was to actually test and compare the responses of sugar sensing taste neurons to mixtures. And so here now we're looking at uh, responses uh, of the sweet sensing or sugar sensing taste neurons. So these recordings are taken from L-type syncilla. And again, these are paired recordings uh, from syncilla with sucrose alone, followed by a recording with a mixture of sucrose and octanoic acid at the lower concentration. And again, you will see that in the presence of octanoic acid in melanogaster or simulants, the response is either the same or even a little bit lower, whereas in Seychellia, the response is increased um, uh, to a small but significant extent. And so there's significant difference um, in the response uh, of the sugar sensing taste neuron to the mixture in Seychellia compared to the two generalist species at these two concentrations, which are at the lower um, end of the range that we've tested. And so taken together, this is our working model for sort of uh, following up and identifying now the genetic changes that are important for um, these cellular um, variation in cellular responses. And so at low concentrations, the noni acids are more attractive to Seychellia because they uh, activate the sugar sensing neuron more strongly, either singly or in combination with sucrose um, as compared to the generalist species. And based on some preliminary experiments with IR76B mutants, we think that this is an IR mediated pathway. Along with um, this mechanism, I, the, at higher concentrations, the noni acids are less aversive to Drosophila seychellia because they don't inhibit the sweet sensing neuron to the same extent. And based on some previously published work with OBP57 DNE, as well as a candidate OBP18A, um, which is lost in Seychellia, but it's found in um, simulants in melanogaster, um, we think that this is an OBP mediated pathway. And in addition, it's possible, right? We haven't ruled out that variation in bitter taste could also be contributing to this difference. And again, based on our um, experiment, preliminary experiments with GR33A mutants, we think that this is a GR mediated pathway. And so our current uh, approaches are focused on identifying candidate genes um, using various mm -hmm. criteria. Mm -hmm. And we're um, uh, testing these candidate genes in melanogaster and planning to test them in Drosophila seychellia as well. And so the project was initiated by Sandhya Charlu, um, who is a graduate student in my lab. And uh, once it was turned over to Monali Day, she's been single-handedly leading the project. Um, she's a student in the neuroscience program. And we've had a very fun collaboration with Alex Keen's lab. And uh, Liz Brown has been doing the calcium imaging um, to complement the electrophysiology studies. So I'd like to thank the organizers once again, and I will stop for questions. Say hey, thank you for that really interesting um, talk. I was thinking a little bit about how, how do you know that they can't smell the 
the various acids in your assays? Or is there a way? I know, sorry, I'm a little factory person. So of course I'm trying to bring it back to olfaction. But just in the sense that we know that there's differences in their olfactory preferences, have you tried to taste assays and then tell us flies to see if that affects? I thought, yes, I thought I wasn't going to have time to, uh, and I realized I finished early, but we do, we have, we've tested, uh, we've tested orco mutants, and we've also tested orco antennalus flies, and we've also tested Seychelles flies with their antennae removed. Mm -hmm. And so we can essentially, so, so there's a, there is, certainly they smell them. Uh, these volatiles are, they're, yeah, they, they, they do smell them. And so the, the curve shifts a little bit, but the shape of the curve remains the same. Okay, okay let's see if we have any questions. Um, don't see any questions quite yet. Karen, can you ask the uh, remind the attendees again that we cannot look at the hands because there are hundreds of people attending. So please type your question in the Q&A. I do see a question from our panelist, Zane. Um, so we can perhaps start with him while we wait for questions to come in. Hey, Omar. Well, great work. Nice hey you. there. So the behavior essays, I see that um, they, they look really good. So uh, do you think there was an olfactory combined effect in choosing the substrate, or did you try something to do separate the effect of olfaction from the taste? The so choice we, for laying eggs. Right, we did, we did, we did remove the olfactory contributions, and we can, we do see the same sort of differences in in behavior. Um, so, so certainly, so the curves shift if we remove the olfactory contribution. So there's certainly an olfactory contribution. But overall, the conclusions don't don't change. Mm -hmm. So we see the same sort of effect. We do see an enhancement uh, at the low concentration, right? Uh, increased preference in Seychellia and uh, reduced aversion at the higher concentrations in Seychellia, even if the antennae are removed in Seychellia. Mm -hmm. as, and we see sort of the same pattern in orco mutants as well as orco antennalus flies in um, Melanogaster. So this is sort of a related question um, from an anonymous attendee. Mm -hmm. It says, hello, I was just wondering, since you mentioned orco mutations and that the response to fatty acids was still there, have you looked at any possible IR mutations? So we haven't yet looked at any specific IR mutations in the antennae, if that's what, I, I guess that's what the question is ask, asking. I guess possibly. Yeah. yeah. So what we did was we looked at orco antennalus flies. We just removed the whole antennae. So with the orco mutant, then you know the palps are 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 not functional, and the antennae were surgically removed. Great. And um, there's also a question from Hiromu Suzuki. Mm -hmm. Great talk. Lack of sweet cell inhibition in Seychellia is very fascinating. Is it attributed to mutations on sweet sensing GRs in Cecilia, or are there potentially other mechanisms? So we have uh, we've tested we've tested that candidate ODP. So that was that was one of the first um, that was an appealing candidate because there's work from um, Matsos lab that had identified OBPs as sort of potentially being involved in uh, OV position preference. Um, and as, as well as Craig Montel's lab showing that an OBP is important for bitter mediated taste inhibition of the sweet neurons. And so there's one appealing OBP candidate, OP, OBP 18A, which is lost in Seychellia. And so we've done the RNA experiments in Melanogaster for that candidate. And actually we see reduced inhibition. So that's very exciting, but it does have off target effects. And so we have to follow up with, uh, you know, all the appropriate experiments before we get too excited about that one. Um, so the second part of your question, though, it's entirely possible that the, there are, that variation in GRs also contributes um, because the idea is that uh, the OBP sort of would facilitate, well, we don't know, 
But one model is that the OBP would help to carry the taste into the sweet receptor and the taste in would di di directly inhibit the sweet taste receptor. So potentially variation in both the OBP as well as the sweet receptor could be involved. Good. Um, let's see here. Um, from JJ Ju. Fatty acids are water soluble and can distribute in the syncellum. Why would OBPs be involved? There, I mean, their solubility is limited. And so um, I, would, I, I would imagine it's the same as a lot of bitter taste ends that perhaps it just increases the sensitivity. Mm -hmm. Let's see. I don't see any more questions at the moment. Oh, honey, honey, do yeah. I Analyst has a question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, have you looked for tests in neurons on the leg, especially the recent uh, work from Herbert Amran? He identified some neurons on the leg detecting some acids and mediating of position preference for these acids? There, um, so the recent, so which, which recent work are you talking about? Which recent, the current biology paper, I do believe it's 2019. Yes. Yes. So, um, so there, I so there. I think so. So we're quite interested, actually, in 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 following up on sort of the differences between in calcium imaging and electrophysiology. That's something we don't have a very good answer to yet. So we haven't been able. So there's we've not been able to see robust or sort of spike activity in all the groups of neurons that are that where calcium activity has been observed right and so to some extent i'm i i think that uh, we we haven't repeated exactly the same things haven't looked at exactly the same neurons and ha, you know haven't done exactly the same sorts of assays so i i don't quite know how to answer your question <laughs> Let's see. I think it's interesting that you're saying that the calcium and the ethos don't always correlate. Um, we've seen a little bit of the same thing for in the olfactory system as well. I wonder if it has to do with sort of nonlinearities in the calcium response where it's just very sensitive, but then sort of tops out at a sort of lower maximal than some of the ethos responses, or if there's alternative sources of calcium coming in that aren't eliciting spikes. I wonder right. if there's similarities between the two systems. Yeah, so I don't, I don't, I, I don't know. I think in the case of the bitter taste neuron, right, where it's GR mediated, I, I, I feel like it, it, there's a congruence between the two. But in the sweet taste neurons, we haven't been able to. There isn't, isn't a match. So one possibility. So our, we spend a lot of time just ruling out trivial possibilities that there was just it was because of the electrolytes or things like that. Um, now we're wondering whether it has some, one possibility is maybe um, has something to do with membrane. So fatty acids can in fact interact with the membrane maybe because we're, we're actually measuring the back propagation of the spike. If something changes in the membrane, that could be an issue. So we want to try recording closer to the soma. Um, and so that would be one way to do it. Um, and there are lots of other possibilities uh, that we can follow up on. Yeah, but because of that, I think we haven't been able to look at appetitive uh, neurons that have been described by other groups in more detail. Just mm -hmm. to wrap up Hani's question, response to Hani's question. Okay, I think that just brings up a question in which was the more relevant um, aspect for the downstream neurons, the calcium that we're measuring or the... Yeah, the yeah, yeah. So I don't think there's any more questions in the Q&A at the moment. Um, do any of the other panelists have any more questions? Just to add the calcium imaging data and the single unit data. So for olfaction, most of the orders were linear, the responses when we did. Um, uh, at higher doses, just readers out, they don't correlate with the higher doses, but most of the lower doses, there's a tight correlation between the calcium signal from both the antenna and the antenna node and the single unit data from the olfactory central neuron. So what we're seeing probably is probably contribution of IRs and the different sensilla 
And uh, so it could be more than just uh, uh, receptor binding. Yeah, it could be. It could be something interesting. Yeah. I think. I think we've ruled out that it's just some, you know, some, like I said, some trivial technical difference. And yeah. I think it's time to um, look at it in more detail. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your talk, Anupama. Um, so let's move on uh, to our next speaker. And I think okay. I'm going to throw uh, thing over, back over to Walter. Uh, thank you, Carrie. Thanks so very much. Uh, as we are getting here deprived of uh, caffeine, uh, uh, coral war in Australia just had, had doses of caffeine for the day and getting ready for the transition that's going to have late afternoon here and early in the morning there. Coral, it's so great to have you as a co-host of this meeting. Thanks, Walter. It's great to be here. Um, I hope you've all been having a fantastic day and um, I'm really looking forward to hosting a, a great range of speakers through sort of Australia, China, Japan, India, New Zealand and more. Um, starting in a few hours from now. Um, and I hope some of you can uh, stick around for some of those talks later on as well. And I, I mentioned earlier on that was a heroic of you uh, to be moving university in the last two weeks and yeah. also in the middle of another lockdown, I believe, in your area, right? Yeah, that's right. So we're all stuck at home again um, here in Melbourne because uh, of our, our low vaccination rate and, so, and the Delta strain. So um, hopefully I won't have any technology troubles, but uh, fingers crossed. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. We are going to go back to Coral War sometime soon. And now we are going to move to the next presentation. The next presentation is by Preeti Sarin, a neuronal network for gustatory decision making under conflicting test information in Drosophila. She's also from Yale. And you might be wondering why you have so many uh, participants contribute to speakers from Yale. I have to explain to the audience that we were very careful about the selection of the keynote speakers, taking into consideration the, the geographical uh, part where they are coming from, uh, the gender balance, what kind of uh, uh, animal they are talking about, and so on and so forth, to make it the program as fair as possible. But for the contribute of the presentations, the only criteria that we took into consideration was the first to come to first to be served basis. And when there was some conflict information, something that we're not so sure, we consult with external people like Leslie Vossel or the Kobe Shaw, and got the advice of these people to make the final decision about the program. So therefore, uh, if you have many uh, students from one single institution or many uh, uh, postdocs or so on, it means that they were very fast in submitting the uh, contribution. So now, I turn the floor to Preet Sarin. Preet, you can start sharing your slides. Thank you, Walter. Um, all right, so uh, hello, everyone, and thank you uh, for this opportunity. Uh, I'm a postdoc in the Niederbach lab at Yale University School of Medicine. Uh, and I will be talking about uh, a recent work from our lab uh, on, neuronal, on a neuronal network of gustatory decision-making under conflicting taste sensory information in Drosophila. So keeping uh, the theme of coffee, uh, imagine yourself in a coffee shop. Some of you uh, might wonder if you want to add some sugar or maybe some cream to your coffee to balance the bitterness out uh, from your coffee. Um, and our brain performs similar hierarchical computations every day uh, that help us make decisions and guide our behavior and adapt our behavior to the environment. And when hungry, uh, animals, including Drosophila flies, do similar things. Um, that is, animals integrate food-related sensory information from the external environment with their internal physiological state, for example, the metabolic state, the hunger state, uh, in order to make adaptive decisions such as food choices. And often food-related sensory information is conflicting in valence. So for example, Drosophila flies forage on decomposing fruits and must balance obtaining essential nutrition with avoiding toxins and pathogens, which are usually bitter in taste, while nutrition is usually um, sweeter in taste. 
so we're interested in uh, looking at uh, such uh, adaptive behaviors that lead to food choice in uh, specifically for this project in anti-conflicting sensory information that is sweet and bitter taste information and why we're doing it in Drosophila um, is because uh, fly gustatory system, the Drosophila fly gustatory system provides an excellent platform for mechanistically understanding uh, such adaptive behaviors uh, that involve conflicting stimuli because flies have separate sweet and bitter sensory neurons. So Anupama's talk was a great introduction to my talk. Um, bitter chemicals decrease uh, attraction to sugars and also sweet and bitter sensitivities are both modulated by hunger. And uh, a lot of the people who are actually in this symposium, either presenting or attending, uh, have uh, done wonderful work uh, showing integration of sweet and bitter taste happening at the sensory neuron, the peripheral level, and even up to um, the SEZ or the uh, subesophageal zone level in the central brain. But we don't know much about how uh, these um, sensory stimuli are integrated to form feeding decisions in the higher brain centers. So that is what we were specifically focused on in this project. And so we wanted to know how conflicting sensory information is processed in the higher brain centers and how the internal state, for example, hunger of the animal affects this integration to adaptive behavior. And so specifically, uh, we asked uh, which circuit ensembles in the higher brain center may be involved in adaptive food choice. So for example, which neurotransmitter or which neuropeptidergic neurons might be involved and where um, the integration of internal and external uh, information might be occurring. And so uh, the work that I will be presenting was actually recently published a month ago. Uh, and so um, I will not have time to present all of it, but you can go and read that if you're interested. So, so we started by um, uh, performing a two-choice food assay with the flies. It's slightly different from what Anupama was talking about and what is usually used uh, in the field in that uh, we pro provided a circular arena to the flies and half of the arena was filled with sweet and the other half was filled with sweeter but bittersweet food. And uh, we added uh, colored food dye to the food and the assay was done in the dark. Uh, and the difference is that flies, anytime they're in the food arena, they will be experiencing the taste um, of, of one of the foods um, because it's spread all over the arena. And so we conduct the assay for five minutes. We introduce flies into this arena. It's kept uh, on top of this backlit uh, IR uh, panel and we record the activity of the, uh, the uh, movement of the flies when they are roaming freely and consuming food for five minutes. At the end of the assay, we take the flies out, anesthetize them and record their abdomen color. And based on these numbers, we calculate a preference index, uh, which tells us whether more flies ate uh, the red or the blue food that is sweet or the bittersweet food. And so um, that gives us a preference index telling us in one trial if most of the flies preferred one food over the other. And doing this uh, assays uh, gave us sort of dose response curves that you can see here. So uh, we food deprived flies for different uh, durations, for example, two, six, and 20, uh, 21 hours. And you can see, we kept the bittersweet concentration the same. So it was really sweet, 500 millimolar sucrose with uh, one millimolar quinine. And we increased the sucrose concentration on the sweet side uh, from really low to the same as on the bittersweet side. And you can see when the sucrose concentration was really low on the sweet side, most of the flies preferred the bittersweet food, even though they find bittersweet um, taste aversive or uh, less palatable than sweet food, uh, sweet taste. Uh, and as we increased the sucrose concentration on the sweet side, more and more flies started preferring uh, the sweet food. And you can, can see that uh, at different food deprivation durations, similar dose response curves were obtained. However, the, uh, the curve sort of started flattening as the deprivation durations were increased, uh, meaning that more and more flies um, had less preference for either of the food source uh, for choices. So we had, in other words, more equal preference, uh, preference for both choices that were present, 
as they were um, food deprived for longer durations. So this is in one of the common control flies, uh, genetic control flies, Y1118. We had similar uh, dose response curves in the more wild type uh, CS flies. Uh, and so what we did is then we took this condition of more or less equal preference for either food um, at 21 hours of food deprivation. We used this condition to screen uh, to, uh, a suite of neural subpopulations in the fly um, using optogenetics. And so the idea was if we optogenetically activate or silence different neural populations while flies are making these decisions, um, we might be able to push the decision in one direction or the other. And if that's the case, that would tell us that um, maybe these neurons are actually involved in this type of food choice. And so uh, this is the summary of the optogenetic activation inhibition screen um, that we carried out using Crimson and GTACR. These are the control flies for activation and inhibition. And just very briefly, what you're seeing here is anything in blue shows uh, that the neural manipulation led to uh, a sweet preference. And in red, uh, it, uh, you can see that the neural manipulation led to uh, a bittersweet preference. And these differences are significant, uh, and uh, these preferences are significantly different from the controlled flies. Um, we looked at several uh, subsets of neuropeptides, neuro, uh, different neurotransmitters, uh, for example, dopamine and serotonin, different uh, dopaminergic subsets, uh, also mushroom body kinion cells and central complex function body neurons. Um, and we found uh, four different types of neuropeptides actually that were, in, uh, that were candidate neurons, uh, three different uh, dopaminergic subsets, and very interestingly, a very specific subset of the fanship body neurons, the fanship body layer six neurons, uh, whose inhibition um, actually shifted the preference to bittersweet food. And so the next step was uh, to figure out how all of these uh, identified neurons were actually connected to each other. And so to do that, we used uh, receptor RNA and lag down. And the, uh, what we did is uh, we uh, did receptor RNA and knockdown down of each of the identified neuropeptides and also different dopaminergic neuron, dopaminergic receptors in all of the identified neural populations. So here's an example, for example, for uh, leukokinin. It's very interesting because activation of leukokinin actually uh, stops uh, feeding in hungry flies and its inhibition does kind of the opposite. That is, it makes flies eat uh, more of the bittersweet food that has higher calories. And so we think the uh, leukokine neurons are actually transmitting metabolic state information to its downstream partners in this um, um, bigger uh, in circuit ensemble. Um, uh, a similar um, manipulation for allatostatin actually showed that allatostatin receives dopaminergic inputs, uh, which you can see from the receptor uh, RNA and knockdown studies, and I'm not showing it for NPF and um, DH44, but uh, both of them also receive dopaminergic inputs, and NPF actually also receives uh, inputs from uh, leukokinin uh, uh, neuropeptide. And so I'll just move on to the most interesting part for me here, which is the Fancher body layer six. Uh, and I say it's the most interesting because the receptor RNA and knockdown results actually showed that uh, Fancher body layer six neurons receive mm -hmm. inputs from three of the neuropeptides um, that we identified in the optogenetic screen from a lattice that in a DH44 and leukokinin. So uh, these results show that the neuromodulatory inputs uh, that we've identified actually converge onto the FBL6 neurons. So then we wondered, what do these FBL6 neurons actually encode? They are receiving information from these different uh, neurons that are involved in, in the food choice that we're looking at. And so first we asked, are, are we encoding hunger? And the answer is no, because um, neither activation or inhibition of these neurons actually uh, initiate feeding in fed flies or inhibit feeding in uh, hungry flies. They also do not seem to encode valence. That is just switching on and off uh, uh, these neurons is neither aversive or appetitive to the flies. 
uh, or attracted to the flies. And so what we did is we um, recorded activity uh, from different flies from the assay um, that have made different choices during the assay. And we presented uh, flies taste under the microscope while we were coordinating the activity from the L6 neurons. And so very briefly, what we found is um, uh, without going through all of the panels, uh, flies that chose sweet fruit actually showed strong uh, FBL6 inhibitory activity in response to the bittersweet fruit. And the flies that chose bittersweet fruit did the opposite. That is, they showed um, strong uh, FBL6 inhibitory activity to the rejected sweet fruit. And flies that chose neither fruit sh showed um, inhibitory activity in response to both the fruit choices, as for both the tastes. And so we think that uh, these FPL6 neurons are actually encoding a food choice made by an individual flies. And just to very quickly summarize, uh, we've found a bunch of uh, neomodulatory neurons uh, that receive dopaminergic inputs, which we think is updating the information encoded by these different neopeptidergic neurons, all these inputs then converge onto the FBL6 neurons, we think in the uh, SNP, SIP, and SLP brain air regions, FBL6 neurons then integrate all the inputs that they receive and uh, form transform that information into a uh, choice in that moment uh, that, uh, that is then uh, sent to downstream motor neurons to be executed as the food choice. And this is constantly updated uh, as the fly uh, flies internal state and external um, environments are changing. And with that, I'd like to thank uh, Michael Niederberg, the lab uh, BI, and all of the uh, Niederberg lab members, also Yale Physiology and Neuroscience Departments, um, and NIH for funding this work. And thank you all for listening. I'll take questions now. Thank you very much. PD, uh, nice work. And the, uh, let's see here if we have any questions so far. We don't have any questions. We just want to remind everyone that is attending that we are not, the, uh, uh, not the able to find out if you raise your hand because there are too many participants. So you better type your question uh, in the question and answers. Uh, and also the members of the panel, the same thing for them. Uh, last night, you mentioned that the, you have a separate set of work that you will be willing to present if, you, if you Yes, are. but then 15 minutes was not enough. And so I, I, had, it's, I have the slides, but I like, couldn't go through them. But can you, can you give us a little bit highlight of what that, that would be the other one? Oh, so uh, it, it's sort of like digging deeper into this assay. And so uh, I'm inherently very interested in the behavior part of the adapt the behavior and so just looking at what micro behaviors the flies are like that one of that's one of the things I'm looking at what micro behaviors the flies are performing when they're making these choices and then when they make different choices are they adapting these micro behaviors over time so for example when they transition from one food source to the other food source do they change the speeds at which they do that or is there a specific pattern in which they perform certain micro behaviors for example they walk how much they walk how much they stop where they eat and for how long they do that and things like that and then um yeah and then there's some genetic work uh sort of an extension of this work uh as we are speaking uh les Vosau was tweeting that you are uh represent a lobby for a very active twitter <laughs> so can you tell a little bit the, the the audience about the environment in your lab yeah <laughs> that is correct <laughs> yeah so what, do you have a very open mind environment? Can you tell a little bit about that since we didn't get any questions yet? It's, uh, I would just say it's very uh, flat hierarchy. So uh, we just, everyone is open to express their ideas in lab meetings and otherwise, and it's just very open um, and friendly, <laughs> the environment. Yes, I can allowed see. To, uh, yeah, we're allowed to like pursue our own ideas. So that's great. I would assume that's in the tweets. <laughs> uh, any, any question from the panel? Anyone would like to ask a final question here to Preet? We don't have any questions also from, from the question and the answers. Uh, so I think I'm going to thank you for, for your participation.
uh, lovely presentation. And we are going to move on to the next speaker. Like I said, uh, multiple speakers from Yale University. And now we are going to go to Cal University of California, Berkeley. Uh, Zepeng Yao uh, is from UC Berkeley and he's going to be talk about the serotonergic neurons translate taste detection into internal nutrient regulation. Zepeng. Yes. Um, thank you for the introduction. And um, I would like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to present my work here today. Um, I'm a postdoc in Christine Scott's lab at UC Berkeley. And today I'm gonna to talk about how serotonin neurons translate taste detection into internal nutrient regulation in flies. Um, so nutrients are essential for animal survival. Animals acquire nutrients mostly through feeding. After digestion and absorption, external nutrients become circulating nutrients that support tissue and organ function throughout the body. Excessive nutrients are stored as an, uh, nutrient reserves, which replenish circulating nutrients when their levels drop. External nutrients are um, evaluated primarily by the gustatory system or the taste system. So for example, sweet compounds are often nutritive and bitter compounds are often toxic. Circulating nutrients are monitored and regulated by the endocrine system, the digestive system, among others. Now, the availability of external nutrients can often predict subsequent changes in circulating nutrient levels. Therefore, it may be advantageous to use the gustatory information about external nutrients to predict impending changes in circulating nutrients and prime other systems such as the endocrine and digestive systems for such changes. How this occurs is not fully understood. So we used the fruit fly as a model to address this question and found that serotonin neurons play an important role. We found two distinct serotonin circuits that translate gustatory cues into the regulation of um, fly insulin cell activity and gastric motility respectively. So serotonin has been known to powerfully modulate feeding across animal species, including insects. But the specific serotonin neurons that regulate feeding are not fully understood. Compares to tens of thousands of serotonin neurons in a mammalian brain, there are less than um, 100 serotonin neurons in the fly brain, offering a much simpler system to dissect the serotonin circuitry that regulates feeding. And as many of you know, in insects, the subesophageal zone, or SEZ, is important for taste processing and feeding regulation. We therefore hypothesize that the SEZ serotonin neurons and in particular, the SEL cluster um, receive taste input and regulate feeding. So we first tested if um, SEZ serotonin neurons respond to taste. We label serotonin neurons with a TRHGL4 and perform in vitro um, calcium imaging on, the, on them while presenting taste tense to the fly. So we found that sugar presentation activates a class of serotonin neurons with diffuse and dense arbors in the SEZ. And interestingly, bitter presentation activates um, a different class of serotonin neurons with discrete branched arborizations in the SEZ. So here are the delta F over F images showing the sugar and bitter responding serotonin neurons that we call the sugar SELs and the bitter SELs. So we find both sugar SELs and bitter SELs in a second TRHGL4 line, but in the third line that we tested, um, uh, the third line we tested only contained the sugar SELs, but not the bitter SELs. So when we look at the expression of the three GL4 lines, we found that the, fir uh, the first two lines label all SEL neurons. So green is um, GFP expression driven by the GL4 lines, and magenta is antibody staining against serotonin or 5-HT. However, the third GALFO line is, is less specific. It labels three pairs of serotonin neurons with smaller cell bodies, but not two pairs of um, serotonin neurons with larger cell bodies. So this suggests that the smaller cell bodies are the um, sugar SELs, and the larger cell bodies are the bitter SELs. So through intersectional genetics, we were able to identify and characterize the sugar SELs and bitter SELs, 
So here's, here's a preview of the morphology. So green is the sugar SELs. They have dense upperizations in SEZ, and they send ascending projections to the PI or parse into cerebralis. Um, magenta is the bitter SELs. So these are actually descending neurons and the two cell types together. Okay, so how do we isolate the sugar SELs? So we took advantage of the third GALFO line that contained the sugar SELs, but not the bitter SELs, and performed genetic intersection with a second um, driver called BFD Lex A, which um, only labels neurons in the dorsal SEZ. So essentially only neurons that express both the GAL4 and Lex A are labeled. And the result was remarkable, labeling only three pairs of neurons throughout the entire nervous system, um, the sugar SELs. So we confirmed that um, they are all serotonergic by co-staining for serotonin. So um, show in magenta here. So sugar SELs contain both dendritic and axonal operations in the SEZ consistent with a role in taste processing. And then in addition, they send axonal projections to the parse uh, intercerebralis or the PI. Using specific drivers for the sugar SELs, we confirmed that they respond to sugar detection on the proboscis, but not bitter detection. And flies can taste with their proboscis and legs. And interestingly, sugar SELs selectively respond to sugar detection on the proboscis, but not on the legs suggesting that they might regulate feeding. Um, so super SELs have these ascending projections to the PI that overlap extensively with the, um, with the fly insulin producing cells, showing green here. So the anatomical proximity of the two cell types suggests that insulin producing cells may be downstream of the super SELs. And to test this, we express a, a ligated cation channel, CS crimson, in the super SELs and independently expressed uh, GCAM6S in the DUP2 insulin producing cells for calcium imaging. Optogenetic excitation of the sugar SELs robustly activated the, um, the insulin producing cells. And the response was di diminished by uh, myanserin, a serotonin receptor antagonist, suggesting that um, serotonin, uh, serotonin signaling is required. So this result suggests that um, insulin producing cells are downstream of the sugar SELs and that they will also respond to sugar taste, just like the sugar SELs. Um, indeed, um, sucrose detection on the proboscis rapidly activate the insulin producing cells. And again, the response is dependent on serotonin signaling. So the insulin cell response occurs within seconds and is independent of actual uh, ingestion indicating that sugar taste promotes insulin cell activity, likely in anticipation of sugar intake. So this is very interesting because um, it has been known for decades that in, uh, in mammals, including humans, sensory detection of food triggers an initial pulse of insulin release as a preparatory mechanism um, to enhance sugar metabolism efficiency. So here we find a, sim a highly similar process in flies and that um, the serotonergic sugar SELs mediate this preparatory insulin re uh, response. So in addition to moderating insulin release, um, sugar SELs regulate feeding. So we manually, uh, we manually fed individual flies with a drop of sucrose and recorded their feeding bounds. Um, when sugar SELs were excited during feeding, flies consume less sugar. And when they are, and when they were silenced, flies consume more sugar. And sugar consumption was also increased when we block serotonin synthesis, specifically in the sugar SELs. So this result indicate that sugar SELs limit sugar consumption. Um, they likely anticipate nutrient influx and provide feedback to prevent overconsumption. So to summarize, Sugar SELs respond to proboscis sugar detection and promote insulin cell activity um, in anticipation of sugar consumption. In addition, they function as a feedback mechanism to keep sugar consumption in check. Um, so how about the bitter SELs? 
So we identify a GAL4 for the beta SELs based on the morphology and genetic intersection with DFG Lex A labels only two pairs of serotonin neurons, the beta SELs. Um, and indeed they are serotonin. Um, so the dendrites of the bitter SELs are in the SEC, while the descending processes are mainly axonal. Bitter SELs respond to bitter detection, but minimally to sugar detection on the probopsis. And in contrast to the sugar SELs, bitter SELs respond to bitter detection on both probopsis and the legs. So suggesting that they respond to the presence of bitter compounds in the environment. So what do they do? Um, so we find that the beta SELs actually project to the digestive tract. So they project to a region called the hypocerebral ganglion, which is an enteric ganglion at the junction of the exophagus, anterior midgut, and the crop. Um, and the crop, as you know, is a food storage organ. Um, and the excitatory serotonin receptor 5HC7 is expressed broadly in enteric neurons in this region. So suggesting a, a potential connection from the beta SELs to the 5-HT7 enteric neurons. So to test this, we optogenetically activated the beta SELs while recording, acti uh, recording activity from the 5-HT7 enteric neurons. Optogenetic excitation of beta SELs robustly activated the 5-HC7 enteric neurons uh, compared to genetic controls. So this suggests that bitter SELs may have an enteric function, such as regulating GI motility uh, or gastrointestinal motility. So to test that, we, de uh, we developed an assay to measure crop contractions in live flies in conjunction with um, optogenetic excitation. The optogenetic excitation of bitter SELs promoted crop contractions um, compared to genetic controls as quantified here. Activation of 5-HC7 neurons induce prolonged crop contractions. So altogether, this suggests that um, beta SELs and the downstream 5-HC7 enteric neurons may promote utilizing the food that is stored in the crop uh, for digestion and nutrient replenishment. So to summarize, um, bitter SELs respond to bitter detection and promote gastric motility and likely food digestion through the 5-HC7 enteric neurons. Um, as bitter compounds are often toxic and harmful, uh, frequent encounters of bitter compounds may indicate a bad feeding environment and potential food shortage. So we think that under such conditions, bitter SELs promote crop contractions, and utilizing food reserves uh, for nutrient replenishment in anticipation of limited food intake. So together, today I showed you two distinct classes of serotonin neurons that use gustatory cues to predict um, nutritional states and regulate endocrine and digestive functions in a preparatory manner. Um, so with that, I would like to thank um, Christine and all the Scotland members for their input and support. Um, I thank JCC and NH for funding and many of our colleagues for fly streams. And um, a small advertisement for myself, I will be on the job market this fall. So thank you all for listening. Uh, thank you very much, Zepeng. Based on your presentation, you are not going to be in, this, in, in that market for a long time. That's going to be soon. Uh, let's move to questions and answers. Uh, I'm 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 regret that I'm not teaching sex physiology anymore because this would be a wonderful piece to be included in my class. Uh, oh, for you. those for those who are not in the in the field of uh, 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 taste doing tasty, so can you explain a little bit to us what happens if this detection on the legs because the legs are not project to the subesophageal ganglia, right? They have. Uh, uh, they have separated ganglia and the, uh, they are going to go directly to those, right? For example, the fore leg, mid leg, and the hind legs, they are not going to project, are they? No. Um, <clears throat> I think that uh, they project to the ventral nerve cords, 
Right. And I'm not sure if some of them also project to the SEC, but eventually the, uh, the information is also related to the, to the SEC. Uh -huh. Yeah, okay. so the, yeah, the, the taste receptors on the legs basically allow them to sample um, the environment while they are walking. That's a beautiful piece that they, the proposed detected all gets the, the information and it allows the crop to release this uh, uh, material that storage to be consumed at that time to start digestion, right? Yeah. That, um, that's one of the one of the conclusions from your work, correct? Right. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, so the bitter SELs, right. So we found that they, they promote crop contractions. And it's interesting that they respond to both, um, they respond to bitter detection on both the probopsis and the legs. Um, so initially we thought it was like about um, the ingestion of bitter, but later we found that like uh, the bitter SELs respond, also respond to uh, bitter detection on the legs. So it's not specific for like the ingestion of bitter compounds. I think um, we think that it's more about like the detection of bitter compounds in the environment. Um, and I, I should point out that um, we show the sufficiency with optogenetic excitation, um, but we don't, we, we know little about how like the natural dynamics of how like this occurs in like in a, in a more natural setting. Um, so it's unlikely, for example, that like every single bitter detection on the leg uh, would trigger crop contraction. Um, so we think that um, there might be some like thresholding mechanisms or even like accumulate uh, accumulative mechanisms that allow um, the activity to build up and eventually promote crop contractions. Like, uh, there's, this question, there's this question from Ishan. Uh, do sugar SCLs inhibit consumption on presentation of non-nutritious -nut sugars? Um, interesting. Um, we haven't tested. We haven't tested that. Um, um, in fact, I. In fact, um, we we did. I like. I didn't test if the sugar SELs respond to non-nutritive sugars. Um, I think they do. What I did was I optogenetically activated the sugar um, the sugar gustatory receptor neurons, um, sugar GINs, and um, the sugar SELs respond to sugar GIN activation. So um, I would think that non nutritive sugars would also activate the sugar SELs, um, but I, I haven't tested whether they um, inhibit consumption on non nutritive sugars. Yeah, that's a very good question. Thank you. And the uh, Jue asks, what's, what's about the water response? Sugar does not attract biting fly but stimulates for feeding. How fly find the sugar source? Um, sugar source? I'm sorry, I, about water? Yeah, uh, I, I'm well, sorry. The, yeah, so the, the initial question, I'm going to rephrase it here if uh, I got it right. What, what is about the water response? Sugar does not attract biting fly, but stimulates for feeding. How fly find the sugar source? I see. Um, so we haven't like um, I haven't tested whether they responded to 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 water. Um, as far as I can tell, um, I think I yeah I I haven't tested that systematically, but um, at least for the sugar SELs, I know that um, they they don't respond strongly to to water. Um, and then how flies find what uh, sugar the resources? Sugar store, yeah. Yeah, I think um, they can detect sugar um, with their proboscis and, and their legs, I guess. Um, like there are taste receptors on. Yeah, I, on, I think her question is that because sugar is not volatile and they, how do they find this sugar source without? Oh, I see, I, I think see. That the, I think it's at the core of the question. Oh, I see, I see. Um, well, um, like in, in in nature, right? Uh, many of the food sources also like have smell, right? Uh, have smell. So I think most likely they will be attracted to the feeding sources through smell. Um, and then once they land on the substrates, they can detect 
uh, whether there is a um, a good amount of sugar with their with their gustatory receptors. Very good. So let me see here. I ran out of time, but let me see if there is any pressing question here. It's not. Uh, uh, so thank you very much, Zepeng. It was very nice to have you here.